Okay, at 6.30, I'm gonna call the meeting of the housing committee to order. Um, Did we make a decision about, was it Monty who was gonna take minutes? Yes. Yes, she has graciously agreed to help with that today. Yeah. And um, I think for tonight, because we're really just gonna have a couple of discussions, I'm not gonna talk about any other roles. I think we wanna really try to just get into the meat of things. Um, I circulated two different sets of minutes for approval. One's all the way back from April, April 24th, 2023. Um, does anyone have any comments or questions about those minutes? No. no. Motion to approve them as written. Motion to approve. Can we just do, we just do a, approve all those minutes? Yes. Okay. It's one, one swell foop vote. So Got yeah, it. I'll second that motion. Okay. No comments on the August 14th minutes then? Great. Thanks, Brant. Yep. All right. So my first item of news is that um, we met last. You need roll call vote. Roll call vote on the minutes. Frizz, Frizz probably. Yeah, because it's a Zoom meeting. Oh yeah. gosh, thank you, Fred A and B or O and B. I guess. <laughs> yes. Right? Approve. Yes. Yes. Fred's yes. Yes. Um, yes. Fred's yes, Montserrat's yes, Brant's oh, yes. Nice. Okay, thank you for reminding me. Um, so my news item is that we went to the select board with a housing production plan last week and um, Megan did her presentation and the plan was approved unanimously by the select board after a small discussion with no changes. So I'm really happy about that. It will be submitted next to the state where we will hear back in sort of a 30 to 60 day time period about what um, comments, if any, they have or questions or changes. Um, it sounds now like Megan's done a few of them. So I'm guessing and nothing will be too major that that comes back to us, if anything at all. Um, so I'm really pleased about that. Um, once we get through, I think the other agenda items tonight, we'll I'll sort of process a little about next steps and where we're gonna move with a couple of these items. Um, let's talk next about the housing production plan strategies and um, what people did to kind of analyze them and think about priorities. I. Um, I had the six pages printed out on my dining room table for a while and I was trying to move them around. There's a lot, it's a lot of information. Initially, I wanted to rank all of it, but that is way too much, or at least in my opinion, it felt like too much. So I kind of settled on a few things for the planning board and um, a few things for the housing committee, et cetera everyone else. <laughs> um, but I wanted to see before I said anything what other people had to say about comments about that. Um, and what uh, just but, popcorn. But clearly opinion. from the from uh, appendix 27, the planning That's board right. has, the he has the heaviest lift. Really, seriously, the heaviest lift. Right. Yeah. But and there's no there's no commitment on the part of the planning board, you know, really yet to, you know, to do anything. Do anything and we're not required really. to do anything, right? right? right. We wrote the right. plan. But, we can walk away if that's like. But we're not, the, you know, I'm not proposing that. I'll no, say of course not. one of the things that's been on my mind, both is sort of with and without my planning board hat on, as I look at what well, really all the zoning strategies, but even with many of the ones that were tagged to the planning board, I felt that I I had a lot of misgivings or like I, I didn't feel a lot of confidence personally in knowing which of these were, would really, you know, make a difference, right? So yes, FERCOG has recommended all of these things. Um, 
And you, I suppose that might imply that at least it's FERCOG's view that all of them, you know, or each one individually will make some positive difference. But I was thinking that I would really benefit and maybe this committee would benefit from more ex outside expertise because for example, many of these planning board items are going to take a lot of time and effort. We've seen at least one example where there's a chunk of bylaw having to do with cluster development in the zoning bylaws that has you know, never been used, right? So at some point in the past, the planning board went through whatever effort they went through to get that into the zoning bylaws and it made no difference. Like nobody took advantage of that. And, and maybe that's just something special about that one feature of the, the bylaws. But as I like, as I thought about these ADUs, um, I like in general, the idea of reducing barriers to ADUs. Um, but I wonder like, well, what's going on in Waitley with ADUs or people building them? Um, is there something, would people build more of them or faster um, if we did, you know, 1B versus 1C, right? And so I'm sorry for the long, a little bit of long-winded coming to a point. I was thinking that I, I wanted to put out there the idea of at least maybe talking to some people at say our local CDCs. I know that Valley CDC has been making a lot of progress in um, affordable housing in Northampton. And of course, again, Northampton is very different from Waitley and I'm not trying to suggest that Valley CDC's experience in Northampton would be you know, directly applicable. But I, but I feel like as a CDC, they would have some perhaps ability to look at some of these, provide an outside and independent view uh, and help us prioritize what these are. Because I'm really struggling, Catherine, about you know, racking and stacking these. Like, right. I know I have a sense for the planning board ones, which ones are kind of easy and which ones might take more effort. But I am very lost at having a good feeling for, like, I don't want to waste planning board time to do things that are not going to move the needle. And I just don't know that any of us, I mean, or at least I'll just speak for myself. I really don't know enough about the rest of you, but I certainly don't bring enough um, expertise to look at these and say, yes, we really should aim for doing one C soon because that's gonna move the needle. So I would think about maybe one or two of us trying to make contact with say the Valley CDC and the Franklin CDC and, and just at least find out if they'd be somebody there who does a lot of work on Right. I, I housing, absolutely, you know, yeah. could advise on bang for the buck. And and maybe among the rest of you, there are other ideas, better ideas for how we might get access to outside expertise. Because I'm not yeah. sure we have the native expertise to rank right. these in terms of most likely to have significant impact in Waitley. Right. No, I think that's a, a good point. And it did feel like an analysis where there wasn't as much information and a knowledge, right, for certainly for me as well as as I would have liked. The question that kind of came up for me was could could Megan at the FERCOG also get, because I've read at least two times in the paper over the last few months about other towns, and I swear somebody maybe from this group even sent me an article about South Hadley or an editorial, maybe. That was that me. Ran... There was controversy there around ADU right. expanding the right. size of them. Right. Um, but I know that Megan at one point mentioned, maybe in one of our other sort of anecdotal conversations at the beginning of this, uh, just on the phone together, that I want to say Deerfield was the close community that recently did make some changes. So maybe a place we can also go is is sort of back to Megan to say, hey, do you have access 
that they use so much data for grants that they probably at this COG have gathered more than just Franklin County data about making these changes, right? Because everybody did this to it way back to sort of prevent development from going too fast, right? And now we're all sort of checking in like, oh, but look what else we've done. We've prevented affordable housing from coming to any of these small towns that we're trying to, you know, encourage real planned, slow development. Um, so maybe looking to Megan um, is something to do. I'm happy to email Valley CDC and Hilltown CDC, which is more comparable um, in terms of the communities that they serve to Waitley about the zoning, the changing issues, and if I, they're seeing any changes. And, and I have friends Catherine, in the Deerfield. Wait, sorry. I just have a clarifying question. Yeah, what sure. are you going to ask Megan for? I'm going to ask Megan if they, if the FERCOG has any data on towns in Western Mass that have already adopted some of these similar changes, like making a, a change to zoning that will allow accessory dwelling units by right, for example, with no special permit. Um, because that I, I'm pretty sure I had seen it in the news another time. And then Brant sent me an article from South Hadley who, I don't know if they ended up doing it or didn't do it, but I wish I could remember the second town, but I have a feeling based on the kind of grant writing that they do that the council of governments probably has that at somewhere with that, without too much trouble. If, if I can step in. Sure. I it might be worthwhile for us to to take a step back and look at the proposal because it seems to me they fall into three buckets you've got development of new housing changing laws so that existing housing can have additional units and adding commercial adding units over commercial and if we break it down that way and set priorities of which of those tracks or we can try or at least be aware that we're doing multiple tracks, but those are three very different areas. Mm -hmm. And should should we try to set a priority of which we think is the most important and then relay that to the plane. But before we go back to the FERCOG or anything else, for our own purposes, set our priorities on where we see the best chance for affordable housing in Waitley. Could you say those three things one more time? Uh, building entire new housing or rehabil completely rehabilitating existing housing to add just add units that are not there already. Second is uh, additional dwelling units in existing like two family houses or right and making the zoning related and zoning changing the zoning to facilitate to, that to make it more flexible for additional people to live in existing you know on existing properties. And the third is um, putting residential units on top of commercial. Okay. Yeah. So Fred, just so I, uh, let, so I'm gonna ask you to look at the, just to help me understand the first two distinctions a little yeah. bit better. I think the commercial one is pretty clear, but let's look for the moment at just the ADU choices, 1A through 1E, because it wasn't, so how would you bin each of 1A through 1E according to your first two uh, differentiators? For the most part, I would put anything regarding accessory apartments not in the bucket, which is not building new housing. Okay. Even or rehabilitating 1D, existing housing. Even 1D. Yes, I mean there there you might have property, you know, homeowners who build something in response to a a new regulation or a change regulation, but I think that's secondary to having people using existing structures okay. for housing, you know, do, doing some internal rehab, as opposed to either building an entirely new structure or a habitat for humanity type project. Mm -hmm. or completely rehabilitating a pro uh, property such as on LaSalle Drive, yeah. where so you've the, got 
where you've got technically a structure, but it has to be, you know, no one's living there and it has to be rebuilt. Right. One thing that all those also have in common is that they really help with the little a affordable housing, right? Yeah. I don't think we we would actually impose any affordability restrictions. Like these would never be units we would count on adding to the subsidized housing inventory at the state level. These would be, nor would we really track the rents people were choosing. This would just be to increase housing units in town in theory to, to get sort of right. more. The, the first two are different ways of increasing the number yeah. of housing units, but one is more for existing structures right. and the other is more for building from the ground up. Yeah, I, I think a, an, another way to look at this maybe, and and, and I, I can I can see people in town are, are wondering, what is this committee doing? We've got money to spend that's been sitting on books, not saying we need to hurry up and do it, but we've got money available to do something. And people are saying, well, you're not doing anything. I think that's one reason we're not getting any any volunteers for membership uh, members here. Because uh, they feel we're spinning our wheels and not accomplishing anything. And I think there's there, there's kind of two approaches. One is if you talk about zoning and ADUs and, and all this, that, that's more of a policy decision. We don't need money to do that. We can change that unless we want to fund some of the types of improvements. But if we're looking at housing development in new locations, and whether it's single units or, or multifamily, I think we, we should be trying to find out how that's being done. Who can help us do that? And you know, a good example is across the river in Sunderland. They've got a unit there that's that's uh, been developed over the years. Uh, Catherine, Catherine, I'm sure you know other locations you've worked on where they developed uh, housing, multi-unit housing like that. If that's where we want to spend our money and that's going to make an impact on housing in a town and people are going to see that the housing committee is doing something, then I think we need to focus on that and talk to people, them agencies, whether it's Franklin County or Pioneer Valley, that to help us get started. I mean, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a few years. It's really common for housing committees right. to get started and take a very long time to actually build right. anything, in particular in small towns, because it's not possible to do it without hiring consultants small towns don't have the expertise to do the grant application to figure out what sites are feasible it just doesn't work it takes multiple years right. of looking at sites multiple grants and methods of support and consultants from outside contractors and i don't want to get too far off topic fred but i kind of feel like we've talked about that at the housing committee at length over the last 10 years on and off as wow. to why we haven't been able to move anything forward. I think that we made a little bit of progress with the DeMaio parcel in particular at yeah. your request to try to get it put on the market and have no takers, right? right. Um, and then obviously what happened at the last meeting was a study that got done. Um, I think your comments about people, what people are saying on the outside aren't really relevant to our I, I'm not I'm not gonna have a discussion about that during this meeting. I'm I'm interested in really trying to talk about I think your bigger question about maybe what's the overall purpose of the housing committee. You're sort of laying out two things. There's a purpose for the housing committee, which is broader than just generating housing, and there's the housing trust, right? And okay. the trust is what's holding the money, not this group, but this housing committee. Okay. So it's kind of two separate things. We have access to money through the Community Preservation Committee, yes, but you know, there's more that a housing committee can do than besides adding housing, big A or little a, affordable or not, in the community. And I, I think, Catherine, in line with what you're saying, you know, having been on this committee six or seven years now, we're just our strategy has been to keep our eyes open for opportunities that right we, we have some money but it's not enough to do want to really be proactive and build something it's money that would
help build something. That's right. right. It might fund the so, planning. You know, we, we, we looked at DeMeo, and now that is possibly coming back into the conversation, depending on what, you know, what happens to that property. We tried to pursue the LaSalle properties and pretty much got nowhere with it. So right. I, I, I think it's a matter in a town this small with relatively few appropriate properties that come on the market even it's we, we can try to be more aggressive in pursuing it and get consult you know spend money to bring consultants in to try to figure out a way to to do that but we have to make that that's a conscious decision we have to make that's right we have to that's decide the approach to or the accessory right. apartment type thing is the approach we want to take. I, I don't think the commercial, second floor commercial, even though there are several proposals for that, is viable in this town. I don't think that there's any property that lends itself to you. The study on the DeMeo property looked at it for that property and came to the conclusion it wasn't viable for them to have a commercial with a second floor residential. So I looked, I did not read all 200 pages. Well, so that's the second topic, right? But right. I appreciate that you're saying it now in the context of trying to get at picking some priorities, but I... So can I maybe just make a comment? Because I, yep. I want to pick back. I just, I do want to say that I'm sympathetic to what Fred Orlowski said, because I think there are some, I think there's at least one strategy down there where maybe we might be able to spend some money to have some impact and might need to do that. But let me just table that for a second because I want to pick back up. I liked th Fred's three-way, you know, binning idea. I wanted to throw out another couple of ways of thinking about how we might pick and choose priorities. Uh, and Because I've been thinking of it, particularly from a planning board perspective, of anything that might come before the town, um, and I think about what's likely to win support from residents of Waitley and what's likely to generate opposition. And that line of thinking led me to conjecture that there might be two ways of dividing these strategies. Um, and it's not a perfect, but hear me out. Like one is doing things that people in town will see as helping people who are already here, right? Like maybe making more ADUs possible, like people who already reside in Waitley could be like, yeah, I could see the value of being able to do this and do that. And, and, and I think when Waitley residents see things coming before town meeting that are clearly focused on how it's going to help existing residents, like, stay in their homes or add, a, add caregivers or, you know, basically continue to live in Waitley um, rather than having to leave due to affordability. I think that'll be very appealing. There are these other things that I think are in uh, mixed in among these zoning strategies. And maybe it's to me the elephant in the room. You know, I, I sort of think <laughs> maybe Waitley is very different, but I do think that Waitley citizens like most homeowners are very concerned about property values and they're going to look at certain things as oh my god if that's going to let people who are outside Waitley come into Waitley and possibly people we're not sure we want in Waitley then we're going to hit opposition around those things and I'm not saying that we don't try to do the right thing but if we like like my intuition is that um, allowing two family homes uh, by right might be an example where citizens might say, you know, this is going to wreck property values because now all of these two family homes are going to spring up and Waitley is this single family on big lots place, you know, and nix that. So I'm thinking a little strategically versus I'm thinking that we might be sensitive as we're picking and choosing what we want to prioritize, look at it through the lens of, is this going to really be appealing to people who are already in Waitley? 
or is this going to help bring in expand residence options within the bounds of Waitley that people who are not in Waitley could take advantage of, which raises all these other things that Waitley residents may be concerned about. Right. All right. So, so that was another way of looking at the priorities. I thought I, a lot of the ADUs are very much appealing to existing Waitley residents. And if I, if we were persuaded that there's appetite in Waitley for more ADUs and people would be building more ADUs if we made some of the changes suggested here, then I'd be all in on that. I, I, I think we can should I ask worry a about... Oh, sorry, um, go ahead. Yeah, I, um, in your framing in the beginning, yeah. I thought you were going to say there were two things that... Yeah, so one is, ADUs. it's... Thank you, let me clarify. The framing that I'm using is... Um, zoning strategies that would be that would make that would be beneficial primarily beneficial to existing Waitley residents so sort of yeah, basically one. the idea of making it more possible for Waitley residents to stay in Waitley affordably and then the the alternative is it, it's sort of inward versus outward facing I think there are zoning strategies that are outward facing in the sense of we want to expand, we want to create more housing in Waitley so people who don't currently live in Waitley could now right. come in and live in Waitley. So you right. just to make sure I understand this correctly, um, you're saying there are two ways we can look at it. And the first one is more likely to win public support. This is my intuition. Right. OK, right. just wanted and, to make sure I understood. And, and maybe I'm, I'm just too cynical and dark in thinking about how everybody's obsessed with their property values and anything that gets suggested that people in town see as a potential threat to their property values will just generate opposition. But right. in fact, um, in making it easier for people to create and use accessory apartments will benefit people from outside as well. Yes, but maybe, but Waitley residents may see it as a, a more direct benefit to them. Very rarely, I think, like if I don't have the space, but if I were thinking like, gee, I'd like some extra income you know, there's the affordable strategy that says, create a new ADU on my property that I'm going to rent out for income, and that'll let me stay in my the main house. But I, again, I, this is where we, I feel I, I need data. Like, data. I don't know yeah. how many people are building ADUs and renting them out versus building them and then moving in, and I, I just don't know. I, I, yeah, I, 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 Brent, I, totally I think you're, agree. you're, you're a little too far down the line here. I think what this committee should be deciding is what we think is the right approach. If we think that additional ADUs is the right approach, then it's our job to get input from the community and sell it and make compromises where necessary. I wouldn't presume that there'd be opposition or that the opposition would be a particular nature, but if that's the direction that we think is best to get the biggest bang for the buck of most units of affordable housing or most people housed affordably, then I wouldn't prejudge the political discussion. I we, we This will be a very, as Catherine said, a long process yeah. and we will have public hearings and you know, do surveys and other things. So I don't think we need now to say, let's go this way because we think the people would prefer this. Okay. We don't know what the people would prefer or what the people would be willing to, to live with. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, Fred. I do think that the one specific item mm -hmm. that Brant mentioned is like one of the least palatable of all the planning board recommended changes. And it, it doesn't mean that I don't think it's something that we should pursue. I just, when I was reading the bit about allowing two family homes by right, my first thought was like, I bet 
I bet there are some people who are going to, that one might cause more of a okay, sting. So, so that goes low on our list of recommendations. That that's that, And that's all I really mean by that is yeah. like, if we're going to say to the planning board, we would love it if you would work on one or two of these items that data may show us is going to help us to over time have a couple more accessory dwelling units per year. And we look at data to try to help us pick my guess is that one is not in and we, we don't happen to give them that one as a recommendation. That's right. Fine. We just pick. Right. So we pick something so, else. Right. I, so I think we're we're sort of getting here. I, you know, the the three pronged strategy that you talked about. Um, I had guessed when you were speaking that the third thing you were going to say is something that I'd pulled out sort of pages five and six and maybe some of page four of the six page table talk about some programs and services that are sort of already in existence in the background. Um, Get the Let Out is one of the programs, our housing, the housing rehabilitation program, which is a, an occasional program in Waitley that the Franklin County Housing and Redevelopment Authority will run. And as a, as a town, we've never marketed any of those things through our website. And, and as I was thinking about this, I thought one of the priorities for this year to try to cover as many of the bases as possible might be to work on having a consultant or, ha or hiring you know someone to do this small project where we could get links, add some housing, some general housing information for, um, people who are getting older and who need some support, like ADA related repairs, the Get the Let Out program, Valley Neighbors to help, like all the different things that our community has to offer such that people who currently live in Waitley and may be struggling have a place they can look on the website. Like this was one of my ideas about one of the things I might want our committee not to devote a huge amount of time to, but to maybe try to allocate either as a project for Sylvie or to maybe hire a consultant who's got some web design skills and sort of give them some direction around what we want to add. And, and a little bit of the reasoning I was thinking about that is because if we then two years from now want to say we are applying for a project for 12 units of affordable housing at this particular location based on the study that we 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 can say look we're doing things for our community and we're working on bringing other people in right like we if we're going to build new housing and it's going to be affordable housing fair housing laws prevent us from saying we're going to let only waitly people move into this housing we we're not allowed by law to do that we can do preferences for some of the units but um, in thinking that that might be the kind of objection that some people have in our town, it would be great to be able to demonstrate we've done other things. So yeah. that, that's in, the in end my, of my long three buckets. Thing. I was really only looking at things that recommend to the planning board. There, yes. there, okay. there, are, lot, there right. are lots of other educational and process things yeah. on the list. Got it. My, my things are really in line with the planning board has the heavy lift, how are we going to help them set priorities? So I, I didn't make that clear, but yeah, there are lots of educational and other program yeah. oh. programmatic yep. things that we can do, not not related to right. We wouldn't give any of that to the planning board. That would be our job. Right. Right. That's a housing committee role. Okay. okay. Well, yeah, Fred. Uh, I hear what you're saying about a database and getting that kind of information that would help attract people to Waitley. Doesn't some of that, I, I'm asking a question, does some of that exist at FERCOG already? Don't they do that for the county? To I think they have a lot of that data. And I think at the last meeting, well, I think at one of the meetings I have attended, attended in Megan's presence, I'm not sure if it was housing or not, she mentioned that the inspections program has a bunch of data that we can extract from as well. So I'd need her to 
refresh my memory, but yeah, the COG has a lot of data. So we can ask them questions. I've got, with this and with some other things that have come up, I don't like relying on their data, not because it's inaccurate, but because it covers the whole county. And Waitley is, you know, being the farthest south, closest to Northampton and the colleges, has a very different demographic look than Gill or Orange or sure. a lot of the other places in the county that make up the data. So taking countywide data has to be with a large grain of salt. Right. And I think some of the data we can get town by town as well, but I, I get what you're saying. And I wonder if we can use some Hampshire County data and whether or not yeah. Franklin County has access to that. The Fertile probably can, has a reciprocal agreement of, or right. cooperation. But I, I just want to make sure that getting data from them isn't always perfect because our demographics just very can be quite different from the, a lot of the other towns. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, if I were to take a planning board eye to these strategies and give my sort of gut level sense of the sort of balance of bang for the buck and ease of getting it done. I'd say the ADU recommendations are probably easiest. I would, I don't know which of them make sense. And again, I would caveat this with, I'd like to know a lot more about ADUs in Waitley and surrounding towns. Um, just to sort of help decide what really makes the most sense for Waitley in terms of um, AD. Right. But that seems like, those seem like they're they're pretty doable and, and likely, I, I think Fred Barron has a fair point about the political implications, but I think that it would be a, a relatively easy sell at town meeting. I think and I would... I, I completely agree. I think also given that our our best theoretical site is the Domeo site right now, and that is going to be several months before we even get the study back on the highway garage possibility for it. I think that unless something falls into our laps, putting the new construction on the back burner and concentrating on ADUs and related subject is probably the way to go at this point for this committee. So, so thank you. So I'd say the, the two family homes, probably not. I looked at the third set, increased housing supply where public transit is available. And my sense there is there were already discussions that it, that seemed like that was gonna be challenging. We don't have, a lot of commercial structures where this would make sense and it's not clear by doing it, new commercial structures would get built. I mean, so I was kind of pushing the threes aside. Um, the fours, again, I push aside. There's a feasibility study. I already know this whole thing about soil-based lot sizing is gonna be another big complicated issue. So I didn't sort of see any near-term and maybe the water situation as well, right? It, maybe, yeah. yeah. I, the, I would um, say we, we, we don't have to decide this tonight. No, I think I understand. Come, come, you know, narrowing it down to a group of things we want to consider, we can go back now, look at them, and discuss priorities within this. The housing plan isn't even approved yet at the state level, so we don't have anything in and I, I'm, on, I'm good with that. And in fact, what I wanted to do is sort of pick out a couple of these strategy areas where we then might do the next level. Right. But uh, but if, if we if we can rule out even discussing for now, you know, a large swath of the report right. and start focusing in, I think that would be good. Right. So I would be recommending, you know, looking at 1A through 1A skipping 2A and 2B, 3A, 3B, 3C, 4A, 4B, even 5A and 5B. And it looked to me, 
so this is just my, again, just my one opinion. I thought that in the incentivized affordable housing units, the sixes, so I've, I'm thinking of the ones and the sixes, I thought were some opportunities. I liked what I liked in some of the sixes, like let's take an example of 6B, waiving dimensional requirements in certain zoning districts for units that are affordable or senior only with special permanent site plan review. I mean, I'm a little unclear on how you would, you know, ensure that they are affordable or senior only in perpetuity, but assuming you could do that, um, I could, I could see, yeah, I, I could see that being something that would, um, so I'm not convinced that the ADUs help us much with uh, the SHI piece. Right, I would agree. Right, but it I think it would be too maybe, complicated on homeowners yeah. to get but to maybe that. Maybe in the sixes. Yes, I saw some opportunities, and I sort of liked the idea. I kind of felt like some of these things could be sold, where Waitley residents would say, "Yes, I'm. I want to make sure we have more housing that's restricted for seniors only, or." Yeah, we'll 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 accept a certain amount for low low income, right? So I would suggest we to use for a barren term, sort of throw away the twos, threes, fours, and fives for now, and focus at the next you know iteration on looking carefully in the ones and the sixes for recommendations for the planning board. Makes sense to me. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with that. Um, I'm going to wait and ask this question on the next agenda item about the residential and commercial thing, because it, it I missed it in that study. But again, I didn't read like, just the executive summary. <laughs> in my head, because I know about funding sources, I'll just say this. There are... Um, site specific funding sources that can provide more total money for a project that has mixed use residential and commercial that doesn't mean we want to consider it because i know about a funding source right like that in my head years ago one of the places that we approached to talk about the demayo property said they wouldn't consider a residential only project, but they would love to consider a mixed use commercial residential project there. So yeah, the, that the, the, the problems with access and septic and you know, a lot yeah. of water issues. Right. Issues that's and that's site. why I thought maybe I would wait because it's where it's the mixed use may location. come into play. Yeah. Is there there is a group working on economic we'll development right. at exit 35. Right. If something comes out of that, that generates possible locations, then that right. We, we can reopen that commercial right. Discussion right. There. And Fred, if that can you just sort of keep in your head to keep us surprised of that particular project? Because again, I'm still not very familiar yeah, with it. Julie Wagner's the liaison with that, but I can certainly yeah you know, she'll report back to the to the board. Board. And it, if anything starts moving at all then there will be public hearings or okay sco scoping sessions or whatever yep is that something i should put in the minutes or is that or should i skip that that's a great question i'm, I think... I'm on that committee okay so fred oh, uh, i would put it in the minutes that we're just what what keeping our eye open for developments of the exit 35 economic development committee Just m making note that it exists and right, that that we may, relevant to us yeah. that comes out of it. Right. As that progresses, there may be right. a way I mean, We don't have housing. any idea what's going to come out of it. It may be nothing. Right. Who knows? Okay. Great. So Catherine, I'm feeling like... Go, oh, I, I did want to just ask this question. Maybe it'll be easy. For, I was looking... This, re this relates to the housing trust funds. So this is sort of a question of what they can be used for. But I was looking at 13A, 
encourage home modification for accessibility and aging in place. And that's right, as it's currently written, it's really about providing information so people can get loans or whatever. Right. But I was wondering, could the housing trust monies be used for that now? So, well, so if the housing trust money is going to be used in a manner similar to the home modification loan program, in order for someone to get that money, they have to A, already be low income, and then B, we have to put an actual deed on their home that they will continue to be low income for a period of time. So just like housing rehabilitation funds, it it you, being used for this, it, it really, the CPA money is just not meant to be able to support communities in that way, unfortunately. Yeah, it, it's a question of CPA money being the seed money of the housing trust. Yeah. And I think that the, there's still ultimately a veto or something from CPC. It, well, we have to follow the regulations and the right. community preservation regulations follow that money. It's, it's a question so, of what, le what level of control or authority CPC has over housing trust money now that it is in the housing trust. Right. It, it still has to follow CPC regulations, right. but it doesn't have to. The CPC can't say we want it to be at that place instead of that place. It's just it right. has no, to I be. Think, I think it may be more of a veto. No, you can't yeah. use it for that. That's right. Exactly. Um, but it, it is unfortunate because there are a number of ways that it would be lovely to support handicapped access stuff. But I do think this that this that actual thing, HMLP, there's a home modification loan program that's a statewide program. And so back to like the marketing piece, like if we could sort of pull that into something where our residents could see it. Um, I don't remember how generous the income requirements are for that program, but um, back in the days before the housing crisis, it was a low interest. It was a zero, I think a zero or a one or 2% interest loan repayment. Okay, I, I still, we, we probably still don't have to get into the weeds of individual. No, you're right. I, I know. I, I I think we've actually accomplished what we wanted to tonight, which is right. to start to really narrow the focus of what we're talking about and give us, you know, something to talk about next time. I think I agree with that. The, the ones and the sixes, right? And that right. sort of works with what I had selected, but I, Monstra sure. and Fred Orlowski, I'm just wondering, I haven't heard too much about specifics from from you guys and what, what are your thoughts well, on how I, this is progressing? Well, I was glad to hear um, Brant uh, talk about how, you know, without our expertise, um, how do we know what is going to work? I feel like I don't have any of that. Like I know which ones sound nice to me, um, I was one thing that struck me was um, on I live on Westbrook Road and uh, we have a new neighbor across the street and and I met her and uh, and I was just telling her about you know who lives in which house and we all have accessory apartments so it's it might be more common than we realize and that might oh. be um, that could be really valuable. It, um, it is quite common in the town. Ah. <laughs> oh. Interesting. Yeah, yeah we it, have it, one, and and so yeah. do many of my neighbors, and other people who don't could. Yeah, yeah. So that might be an easy sell, um, but uh, but I don't have um, I, I don't have any expertise to bring to it or anything else that I wanted to bring up. I, I don't Thank think you. any of us really. Uh, Catherine probably has the most, but yeah, we need outside input. But I think that as a committee, we need to figure out where. You know specifically what what questions we want to ask and of whom, and just keep n narrow the focus to that so we can get right pointed questions to the appropriate people. Okay, I, I kind of agree with what Brent is saying about the numbers one and six, and I've taken another look again, hard look. I don't have it out in front of me, but to see if that's what we want to support uh, from this committee. And the other, I got, 
I think it's mentioned in there somewhere about providing information. Well, we talked about information to the community about what's available for grants or housing and all that. Is is any of that on our website somewhere or even FERCOG website that so people that go to look other than looking at some, uh, Googling some housing program to see what's right. available nationwide? I don't know. Right. I think, um, I think it's not, it might, there might be some links on the FERCOG website to the appropriate website for Franklin County, but that's part of the reason I, I sort of had this like, here's what I want to think about for the planning committee and here's what I want to think about for the housing committee. And in my mind, I feel like the housing committee has multiple roles. I think like what Fred Barron said that the actual construction or new housing piece, I think there are some tasks we can do in the short term, but really we want to wait to see if we're going to, if we're going to get custody of DeMaio property or not. And if we are, then we've got a great place to start. And if we're not, we have some other places to uncover a little bit, but, but that's for the capital A affordable housing. I'm hoping we can support the lower A affordable housing in a couple ways with making some changes the planning board can support. Specifically, it sounds like maybe accessory dwelling, maybe some other one that I was referring to as the Judy bylaw, mm -hmm. which is about the lot size requirement waiver. So, which I think at, actually after all of this was maybe the best one, but we can talk about that at another meeting. I think those kind of can, can get towards making some changes that we, we know, like what Brant was saying earlier about Waitley residents. And I think the other piece I want our housing committee to work on with related to that is, is this piece around, I'm calling it marketing, but it's it's really providing the pro appropriate references to people in town and and how they can look for that kind of information. And Fred Orlowski, you're absolutely right. I don't think any of that's on our website. Mm -hmm. um, I bet most towns, it's not that easy to find, but that's something that we can do. The first one of that, I think we'll work, work with Sylvie on that. Uh, yes, um, that's right. I had S Sylvie down for two tasks and that was right. one of them. Um, out of this, I think, I think knowing, you know, figuring out what grants are available, both for the town and for individuals, it's really two separate lines, and publicizing the public element of that. Right, and and I can hook her up with someone at the right. housing develop housing and redevelopment authority, the Franklin County agency that does do all the housing related stuff. Yeah, that's um, right right in her job description. That's what we should be yep. working with her on. Yep. Yep. Um I just think that it, it would be a great thing for us to be able to do and I don't know what her particular computer skills are around the web piece but I would imagine that um that's something we could work towards finding someone to do. Anyway, should what, we... what are you what are you hearing from the you're in a, was it small community working group on housing yes. is anything yes. out of that that would be useful for this committee so um occasionally i've been going to those meetings for multiple years i would love it maybe if fred orlowski if you have an interest in maybe attending one or two of them to see what it's like there have been some nights where it's been useful and more nights where I've been used like someone saying, what's it like to have a trust? And I'll say, well, we spent two years going back and forth with about, you know, and I'll sort of explain our process. Um, it's a small town working group and a problem I'm having with it is that Greenfield is coming and often has several representatives and for the state of Massachusetts, I recognize that Greenfield qualifies as a small town, but for the type of work that needs to be done, it's a wholly different situation. There was a whole meeting one quarter developed to dealing with homelessness, which clearly is a problem in our state, and there's a huge housing crisis. But, but in terms of what I thought the group was being formed for would be more to tackle some of these things like how can a town who doesn't have a planning staff person 
try to suss out a parcel and determine whether or not it has development potential like the and or how can a town that is our size that doesn't have the community preservation act determine whether or not it would be a good use of their efforts like those are the kinds of questions i thought it would be comparing a lot of small towns the size of waitley um or even as big as maybe maybe shelburne or, or montague but i'm finding attendance depends on the agenda and sometimes i feel like we're a little left out because we're too small for the discussion. So that's my very long-winded answer to that, Fred. Yeah, um, I, I I agree with you, and I, I occasionally look at at some of their meeting agendas and and minutes, and and yeah, you've got Greenfield in there, Montague and Northfield, and whatever uh, discussing things, and sometimes the, the speakers that they have talked to housing and m sized communities not not to a rural community and yeah it's a little it's a little off but sometimes it's useful yeah. what what i'll say is the last meeting that i couldn't stay for had a discussion about deerfield and some of the changes that they most recently made which may have been accessory dwelling related okay. so it'd be good to get that but let's let's okay move on yeah, and we can, I, I'll forward the next agenda I get and see if anybody has an interest in going. It's, it, that's one of those roles I was sort of thinking on over time, but okay. um, yeah, it's been of minimal value lately. So let's talk a little about the DeMaio study um, before we end. I'm wondering what people's initial thoughts are, but I'm actually also wondering, Montserrat, I know it, it's already been discussed at the CONCOM, is that right? Would you be yeah, willing right. to give us a summary of, I, I mean, when we looked at that parcel by ourselves, we had so many questions about if it was even a developable lot because we didn't know. So right. I'd love to hear it. has it. a lot of issues as far as the as what's developable and the wetland and um, and we weren't able to answer all those questions in that meeting because- okay. It needs, we need to look at it with the, you know, state overlay maps and um, what the resource areas are like it, that's not on those maps. Okay. And so some of, some of the drawings are clearly impossible, um, but some development might be possible, um, but there are a lot of issues with that lot. So that's about all I can summarize from our discussion. <laughs> That's if fine. I can, it, it also becomes a legal issue. Affordable housing is a more flexible possibility than some others because of 40B. Does, can we use, can 40B be used to, you know, what regulations can it be used to circumvent? Right. And I, I don't some, know the answer. but not all. Right. Well, so, probably some, but not, not all. Any about, about building in a wetland or in protected areas. It might there might be some waivers about um the septic um but i don't i don't i'm not familiar with those laws yeah well that, that's the thing it's, i i don't know the regulation i know that it makes it more potent better potential for use than other uses when if you put affordable housing on it but you know i know it could deal with probably the frontage issue judy markman brought up a frontage issue and density yeah. It can probably buy. It can deal with density. It can deal with frontage. Yes, right. but probably not um, uh, violating the Wetlands Protection Act. Probably not. I, 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 I probably to... not. But you, in this Commonwealth, it, you never know. <laughs> I would say that it might. It might not. There might be some ways where there is right. a slightly different interpretation. I'll say that. Like I've seen. I've seen maybe where the setbacks, the word that's coming to my head, and I know there are other phrases, but like the amount of feet that you need between something developable and the demarcation line can sometimes be different in 40B. But I don't know if that's specifically with wetlands or if that are other, is another, you know, how many issues there can be with different properties yeah, and it's, it's and what. It's not yeah. something that we've ever, um, since I've been on CONCOM, which has yep. been a while, we have never um, had to deal with that. So I know there are a lot of um, 
there are a lot of things that agriculture can do that residential can't. Um, so I know there are a lot of, there are things that are waived or easements or eased um, for agriculture projects, but um, I don't know yeah. about any other projects that get yeah. things waived that way. And Another so reason a lot of it may depend. A lot may depend exactly how the law is written. Sometimes when laws are written in this state, they were written to specifically get around some plan in Haverhill <laughs> that all of a sudden you come back 40 years later right. and can come in. So right. I wouldn't rule anything in or out on that. Basis. Yeah. Fred. Uh, two things I'd like to say about the DeMaio property. You know, you, you said, Catherine, you know, the housing committee looked at that with a developer. And I think one of their excuses, I guess, for, for not doing anything or not looking favorably was the cost to clear the lot to make it available for development was more than buying a new lot and, and starting with nothing on there. I, I mean, the clearing of what's there would, would be excessive. Uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars even to clear that and they weren't nobody's interested in spending that money to, to start with and and the second point i listened to what judy was saying i think to the select board she made some good comments on the the engineering and financial aspects of, of housing there i mean the, she talked about septic i mean it, it mentions putting septic under a parking lot well no consideration of what size septic you need if you're raising a parking lot, now it's a level. You're going to have four or five feet above ground with a with a parking lot for septic. And there was no consideration financing of, of not only the, the septic, the lot, but of the building, the, the, the two or three structures they were proposing. No mention of, of the cost to do any of that. I think that, the cost that, that factor is going to scare that wasn't in the scope more people yeah, that wasn't away. In, that wasn't within their scope. They, they weren't asked to look at the cost. I know, but at... but to go with that study and say now we want to focus on, on that site, I, I think that and in putting that kind of development, think about that kind of development in a rural community like Whateley, is that something we really want? Well, so, okay, I, I hear what you're saying, that there were some problems with the study, and I would absolutely say that I I was astounded that they thought seriously about putting 24 units on that small of a site in a rural right. town with septic under a yeah. road, like the under the parking spots, that that just isn't, that doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever, like from the get-go. But right. again, when we had talked about it, Fred, we thought maybe we could get two or three units, maybe four units, if you right. remember when we measured it all out. Right. And so I think what we can take away is maybe with further due diligence, that site may have some development potential. I'll speak now quickly to the finances. It's really common for small towns in particular without very many choices for sites to end up with these sites that have been for a period of time unused and want to convert them. And there are lots of steps involved for studies and there are lots of grants involved to kind of cover sort of step by step. The, the first thing I'm concerned about when I read through that is the whole situation with the gas station across the street and maybe was there any gas, is, was there any petroleum that leaked in the ground does that is that going to need a study and i'm thinking are there grants for that i don't know how that works it feels to me like there often are remediation type grants around i don't know i feel like i feel like they aren't always specifically for a site that isn't already like flagged formally as something that is going to have or already has development though so I'm not sure how that piece works, but um, there are multiple financing sources that can be considered that might be combinable to pull something off there. That, I, I think that's all that part. study does is tell us that theoretically it might be possible to do something with that lot. That is as definite as you get, theoretically and might. Right. So, 
Yeah. So what what else though, Fred? I know you, you were sort of saying I I think I think we probably would all agree that twenty four units seems just a little crazy. I think that they probably put that in to try to make propose something that might be economically feasible by having enough units. Right. 12 units might not be enough to be economically feasible. With all the work that Fred, as Fred said, the groundwork to take up a sec, you know, a rotted septic system in a wetland adjacent area is going to be very expensive. Right. So that, like, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the reason that was there. Uh, I don't know that it's that out of character with the area. Sunderland has apartments similar to that. Well, lots of apartments similar to that, and we right. don't have any apartments. Yes. Well, I yeah, but, but just as far as, far as this that. area, it's not right. totally foreign to, to the area. Got it. Just to the town. Yeah, right. It, there's nothing like that in this town. Right. Any other initial comments? Sylvie was really interested in what anyone might have to say one way or another. Um, I'm going to bring up that I think I know that the planning board's on record saying they don't want that the they may not think that this is a great site for housing and that they prefer it be commercial. I feel like I heard that from Judy at one point. I know. I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but I'll say, you know, this is where then I went back to like, well, we 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 heard and I thought the same thing when the housing committee got started and and we asked Brian to put it on the market, which he did, and there were no bites. I feel like does anybody remember how long it was on the market, Fred or Fred, like two That's, years? It, it was it strikes me it was a couple years. of years. Yeah. No bites, no interest. No, um, yeah. I'm not sure making it commercial. I don't know if it attracts more more people or, or not. But with with uh, I guess the, the preliminary analysis we did at Wetlands of quite a few years ago, I think that one of the outcomes, and I don't know if we we never pursued it that much, and it's a matter of what the town wants to do with the property now to whether advertise or what, but. There was enough frontage there for three or four single family units. If somebody wanted to bring build single family homes there, uh, you could do that. There was enough frontage and there was enough lot depth to put septic and, and whatever and stay under wetlands. That that's an option. Land is parcels are cheap on State Road. Look across the road towards going towards Castaways, or you look south of Castaways. There's lots there that have sold in the in the twenty to thirty forty thousand dollar price range recently, and you know if if lots are going that cheap there, it may be possible that some private developer or individual would want to put a house there on Demio property. Yeah, it's going to be one or two, three units. It's not going to be a dozen or twenty four. So, but I, I think Fred, we get back to the problem that you outlined before of the site prep right, process right. on that land may exceed what you can get before you put a stick in the ground right? for what you could get for the houses. Yeah. Right. I think at the end of the day, Fred, what you said early on is, you know, we're, we're going to be in a waiting game or yeah. a waiting pattern, I suppose, a holding pattern for this parcel for a period of time. And, um, once we find out about the highway study and whether or not it's deemed the most suitable or really not just what we find out about the highway study, but I think until the town gets to decide where they want to site right. the highway garage. And that's, that's going to depend on whether this DeMeo is a viable site. And actually right, right, right now, even that's in a holding pattern uh select board has approved spending the money but the select board can't spend the money until there's a special town meeting which probably won't be for another month or two right <laughs> yeah so that that can't even start until the study won't sign even a contract start. which has to wait for a special town meeting Got what, it. what's this project you're talking about the uh study 
for the siting of or the for the siting of the highway garage and the feasibility study. Uh, we've authorized a warrant at town meeting for twenty five thousand dollars for a consultant to look at what the needs are for highway. You know, wh what do we need in a building and where can it go? Those are the two elements yeah. that will be in the feasibility study. So are you saying that if if the feasibility study determines that DeMaio's site is just right for that, then the uh, development question is moot? No. Well, Maybe. We, 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 we don't know. Right. At, at that point, the select board then has to get into, okay, start determining priorities. But right. we can't even start with that until we know, is it even a viable option? If it's determined that it's not, then we need to look at the recommendations of what is a viable prop. You know, it may be another location on the existing campus, you know, near the transfer station and police station, uh, might be on the field between the current department and the fire department. We don't know. But we need a new highway department. That building is falling down. That That's what's driving all this, is that it's a 60-year-old building of cinder blocks, which are crumbling. Right. And, and is woefully insufficient, yeah. as Brant will say from the walkthrough that we did a year or two ago, is just an inadequate building. So yes. you know, it, a lot of this is just, you know, you like a construction project. You wait for the electrician, then you wait for the plumber, then you wait. It's all sequential. Things can't be done in parallel. Right. You have to wait for one report to do the next report. Right. Well, <sighs> it comes back to, like I said at the last meeting, what is the role of this committee? If we Are we the ones deciding where more housing should be in town? Or is some other board telling us where to go to put housing? I, I don't think there's another board or group telling us where to put housing. I think that um, we have the ability to seek out what other options there may be in town. Um, I th this board doesn't have plenary authority. It can recommend. Right. Right. So we can continue looking. I mean, one of the roles I sort of talked last meeting about kind of trying to have some roles that I assign to um, people to so that we can all kind of play a role in the committee and its function. And, and one of the ones that I've kind of had in the back of my head um, is having someone who looks at the things that come on the market, like who looks at, I don't even know, the multiple listing service or whatever every week or something and looks and identifies what the parcels are. And then, you know, shoots out an email to all of us, like this came on the market, it's located here or there, like, is it something we want to look at? Um, I'm going to say that probably most of the parcels that most of the existing homes that come on the market we probably wouldn't be that interested in. And unless it was land, as we've kind of said, along the five and 10 corridor where we're kind of close to public transportation and potentially close to public water supply, it also is probably not gonna make sense as an affordable housing parcel, but that's definitely one of the roles I've had in my head that it would be great if someone you know, wanted to take that piece on. Um, I, I've not done it on a regular basis. I, I never see what comes on the market. I just don't look. It's not a thing I'm I'm up for. Do you mean you mean a role of somebody on this committee would do that? I do. Yeah. Right. Like I, I'm not volunteering. No, it's fine. I, I, I'll, I'll volunteer because I did some of yeah. that already yeah. before when we were looking. And it wasn't Demile. Maybe this the center school committee looking at whether we could uh, rent the space out. What was available in the community in the county, really, or for office space for rentals and, and also sales oh. of commercial property. You know, mm -hmm. I, I went to a realtor in South Deerfield. 
they'll print out any kind of information you want for the last three, four, five years and tell you what's on the market, what the prices are, how long it's been, and and who's buying and selling. I mean, that's that's public information. I can go get that if you want for the committee. Yeah, I mean, I think that checking what's currently on the market in Waitley on a regular basis would be a great thing for us to do, especially then when we can see like, oh, here's something new. Do you remember the parcel on State Road that came up and sold for like $36,000, right. right? To that nonprofit from Connecticut who put four, who then came and asked for the abatement. Anyway, that yeah. would have been, if we had the affordable housing trust and could have said, yes, we want that parcel, that would have been a great habitat parcel. Right. It had low site costs, it's on five and 10. Anyway, I think that would be a great task for someone to sort of take on on a monthly basis. Well, it sounds like Fred Orlowski volunteered. Yeah, sounds like Fred's into it. I'll see what I can get here for the thank for you. Local real estate. Yeah, really. Thanks, Fred. Okay. Yeah, and you don't have to go too crazy. I really think sort of looking our town has doesn't exactly have stuff popping up every few days, but right. you know that's okay. an occasional um anyway, but that wasn't really a thing I ended up putting on this agenda. I had a feeling we would all be sort of mentally worn out by the time we got through talking about all these priorities and, mm -hmm. and thinking about that parcel and how it's kind of exciting and kind of complicated and we have to wait forever to hear if we can use it or not anyway. Yeah, I feel okay. like that's kind of more than enough for one night. Yeah. Um. All right. So in sort of drawing to a close, I'm going to still contact Valley CDC, probably Hilltown CDC, the Franklin County CDC. Fred doesn't do any housing. They just do um, business assistance um, and asks, ask some questions about small communities making changes to zoning for the specific purposes, the way we've kind of talked about it here. And I'll also check in with Megan about data on area towns. In particular, ADUs and these um, incentives for affordable. Right. The, the, right. the one things that relate to the priorities we've kind of notionally set tonight. Yep. Yep. And, and Catherine, you said you had two tasks for Sylvie, and one was um, ask if she would be able to publicize um, the programs that are available to us that people don't know about. And what was the other one? Right. Thank you for reminding me. Um, the other task, I feel like I'm going to actually look to make sure. Oh yeah, it was was to ask her if she had any interest in um, taking advantage to sort of get a little bit more up on on housing. There have been some trainings advertised over the last month or so. I'm trying to remember if there are any still coming. A couple of them were right when she was getting started in June. That would have been good for her, but to sort of give her some background because I don't think she has a lot of housing background. So um, I'm sure on... she keeps up on the MMA seminars and we can just sort of right. make, you know, make, make a note to her to keep her I'll eyes send open her the out. ones that come through. Um, I don't, I think there are specific housing agencies like MHP that it might not go to all the 351 communities, you know, it might, it, but I've gotten on a bunch of those lists. So I'll, I'll try to talk with her about that. I'll, I might just check with Brian first before I do that but um she seems to have an interest in in that and getting somebody on staff who's got some of that expertise would be great yeah I, I think getting her up to speed on it is good as long as we don't overload her she's got plenty to do she, yeah no kidding well that's right and that's why I sort of say that with that like I'll sort of check in with Brian about each one there are some that are you know a two-hour thing here and there um, but there were, there were two day sessions in June. That might've been a little much, especially for the beginning of her tenure here. 
Uh, I think that's all I have. Um, okay, are we? Yes. Motion to adjourn. Let me very quickly look at the oh. first Monday of the month so that okay, it's, sorry. I mean, Wednesday. But yes, I'm ready to do that too. Okay, yeah, no, just set the next meeting first. So that would be October 4th. That's right, 6.30 October 4th. Works for me. Great, me too. Okay. So I'll entertain that motion to adjourn now, Fred. Okay. <laughs> Second oh, okay. motion. Nice, thank you. All right. Do we need to roll call adjourning? I'm raising yeah. my hand. All right. We're all up. Aye. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.